Hi, this is Adrian Laurie, and this is a short video about the common factors, uh, what they are and um, uh, why they're important in psychotherapy. The common factors are those factors of psychotherapy uh, that are there regardless of the particular tradition or traditions that a therapist may be practicing in like psychoanalytic tradition or cognitive behavioral, existential, etc. Okay. Um, effective therapists, uh, regardless of the way that they're doing the therapy, do have certain things in common. This has been studied by uh, the, the researchers and, and thinkers associated with the common factors tradition. And so in this video, uh, I'm going to give you a way to think about what are the essential common factors and what are the basic therapist practices, which is basically the kind of um, classes that are in most kind of standard grad school programs for therapy, the basic therapist practices associated with those different common factors so that you'll get an idea of what it's about. What it ends up being is it's kind of like the basics of being a therapist, the kind of basic skills. And for that reason, the, um, they're in some respects not all that exciting. Um, <laughs> it's the laborious aspect of being a therapist. And maybe also for that reason, um, maybe a lot of therapists uh, end up not being all that interested in them. But uh, the good thing about the common factors and thinking in terms of like, how can I enhance these common factors? What practices do I need to do? Is that it's, it really does help with effectiveness and it's an antidote to the problem of therapists ending up being what amounts to kind of ideologues is that they have this thing that they're doing and they just do that thing whether it's working or not, the client comes to them and they do their thing. And maybe it works for some people some of the time, but it doesn't work for other people or for, for the people that it does work for some of the time, it doesn't work at other times. And the therapist isn't paying any attention to that because they're just doing their thing. They're just doing their psychoanalytic thing or their cognitive behavioral thing or whatever. And that actually does happen a lot, unfortunately. Um, so common factors are important. Now, um, historically, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about who, you know, who are the innovators in this, in this area. Saul Rosenzweig, a name you may or may not have heard, um, was the first person to say, hey, maybe uh, these different therapies are, are all effective, Freudian, Jungian, Adlerian. Clearly, they all have their successes. Maybe, maybe the effectiveness is coming from some source other than the particular techniques um, involved in psychoanalysis or or, or, or Adlerian therapy or what have you. Um, and then he proposed a bunch of them in this short little paper that he wrote. Um, so that kind of started, you know, started things off. Uh, and then there's a, been a number of people since then who've contributed to, to, to thinking about the common factors. Um, uh, Carl Rogers is actually important with respect to two common factors that are looked at, empathy and genuineness, the significance of those two. Um, there was a pair called Dollard and Miller um, and they, they uh, wrote about basically the issue of learning in psychotherapy and, and said a few words about the importance of modeling, which then Judd Marmer picked up on, and he looked at that, modeling. Um, uh, Jerome Frank, very important, he wrote a famous book called Persuasion and Healing um, uh, that looks at common factors uh, such as the importance of, of, of positive expectancy uh, and the, um, the, 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 the setting, the context, the kind of cultural context, the fact that the, 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 the therapist or the healer is kind of socially sanctioned. Um, uh, and then uh, finally, you have a guy named um, uh, Borden, uh, I think Edward Borden, uh, who, was a, who, who, who was an analyst, but he wrote a very influential paper about the, the, the na nature of the therapeutic alliance and the significance of that as a concept that would transcend uh, therapy traditions, in other words, as a common factor. So let me give you a brief summary of what the common factors are. Um, uh, we can think in, in, in simple terms of kind of seven basic common factors, the therapeutic alliance, uh, empathy, um, learning as a common factor, like insight and what have you, um, uh, confidence, in the therapeutic process, modeling, um, the framework that the therapist has some framework around which the client can can organize new understandings, uh, and um, emotion. Okay, if you want to look at the common factors in a in a slightly more 
detailed and comprehensive way, we could think in terms of seven pairs of common factors, the alliance and collaboration. It's obviously related, but they're studied in slightly different ways, somewhat different uh, concepts. The alliance and collaboration, empathy and genuineness, okay? Uh, insight and reconditioning, uh, sometimes th thought of in, in terms of social reconditioning, although it can be different types of reconditioning. That's the learning common factor, insight and reconditioning. Confidence and expectancy, sort of two sides of a coin, but different ways of looking at something. Identification with the therapist and modeling, right? Again, these are two sides of the coin. All of these are kind of two sides of a coin. Frame, framework, the framework that the therapist has some framework, and sanction, the, uh, the therapist is socially sanctioned, has a license or, it, or uh, is otherwise recognized in the community. And um, finally, emotion and catharsis. Okay, so, so if you, think of the, you can think in terms of the seven pairs of common factors, um, and I'll put these in the description below so you can take a look. That's kind of a summary. That's, a, that's pretty much the common factors uh, summarized. There's lots of different frameworks for understanding them, but I think that's a, you know, that's a nice list. It's fairly comprehensive, but remains simple. We can also then associate each pair of common factors with, with, with a basic therapist practice. And this, this makes it practical, because if you, say, if you look at this list, you say, oh, I, I'm not so conscious of that one, and maybe I can get better at that one. What would I do to get better? Well, you practice the basic therapist practice associated with, with that, that, that common factor. So I, I like to look at it this way. Um, we'll start with the alliance and collaboration. That's associated with the, th with the practice of therapeutic contracting. Now, I don't mean something formal that you sign, although, the, although we have to do that um, uh, uh, typically as part of the licensing laws that you do have something formal. But, that ther but therapeutic contracting is a broader concept, and it's, it's ongoing clarity with the client um, uh, about what the, what the purposes are. What are we looking to achieve here? Uh, are we achieving it? Um, and uh, making adjustments when we're not. So we could include in therapeutic contracting, uh, goal setting, we could include getting feedback from the client about how things are going, how's the therapy process going, is there a clarity about, about how we're proceeding, how we're supposed to work, your role, my role, how's the process going, and, how, and then how's the process going for you, how do you feel about it, do you have any feedback for me about the way that I'm working with you, and then what's the progress like, does the therapy seem to actually be helping? don't want to lose sight of that. Um, uh, so that all can be th the part of therapeutic contracting. Now, like I said, it's kind of laborious. It's not that exciting as doing some therapeutic technique and you get something that happens. It's the, it's the, the grunt work, if you will, of therapy, but it's, it's so helpful in terms of uh, making sure that the, ther the therapy is working. This is also doesn't involve some kind of rigidity or, or over pressure to kind of like, it's, um, you know, be accomplishing the goals in this or that particular way, but that there's some clarity of, of purpose. And when that's unclear, there's at least some clarity about that. Um, the, the therapeutic alliance has a lot to do with the quality of the, the relationship. Um, but we just don't want to forget that there's a professional aspect of, of this relationship and that we want that to remain clear. We want the therapy to remain nice and purposeful without being too high pressure in such a way that it interferes with therapeutic effectiveness. Okay, therapeutic contracting is associated with the alliance and collaboration. Empathy and genuineness, we could associate with the, the practice of facilitating disclosure. How do you facilitate disclosure? Empathy and genuineness. As a therapist, it's generally considered to be the case these days that it's better to be, to be clearly a human being than to be some kind of therapeutic machine or, you know, he's a, he's a, I'm, a, I'm just neutral, objective, blah, blah, blah. You know, as a per person's much more likely to open up in, mo in almost all cases. Um, if, if you're personable, um, personable in a way that, that works for that person, you, 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 you want to always be attuned to the client. The purpose of the therapist's work is to help the client. Um, but to be, you know, reasonably open and genuine as a person, people's going to open up better. Um, 
And I think people generally know what, what empathy refers to. So facilitating disclosure uh, is associated with empathy and genuineness. Okay. Um, insight and reconditioning, the learning common factor, we could associate with the therapist's learning, the therapist's research, the therapist's study, the therapist's engagement and activity that's going to allow the therapist to learn about life, about psychology, etc. Um, uh, and, you know, as you learn, you're more likely to, to facilitate helpful insights um, and to be able to operate with the client in a way that's going to um, be um, helpfully reconditioning. Um, uh, so uh, insight and um, reconditioning is associated with the therapist learning or the therapist research uh, not, re not necessarily in the formal sense of research but just the, le the learning process um, now confidence and expectancy, expectancy I would associate with therapist training why? because the more you train the better you get <laughs> and the better you the better you get, the more confidence you're going to have, and that gets that gets um, projected or that that gets conveyed to the client, and it ends up being a helpful factor. Now you can convey confidence and expectancy from the beginning. There's a sense in which it's just a way of being, um, but when you get better, it gets stronger. Okay, now that's not about arrogance or grandiosity. If anything, in order to do really good training, there's got to be a lot of humility because you're working on the things that you're not so good at. Okay, this is a new idea of a deliberate practice is a, is a really good one um, with respect to that. Okay, confidence and expectancy associated with therapist training. Identification and modeling, we would associate with therapist personal development. Now, a lot of grad school programs, they require that the therapists have their own personal therapy, um, which I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, but personal therapy is not the only way that we're going to grow as a person and develop as a person. But the, but you want to, therapists want to work on self-improvement in large part because, this is not the only reason, but in large part because the better you are, the, the more the client's going to absorb whatever wisdom you've developed in life. So, you know, you want to have to always work on your own personal improvement and because and, clients will absorb that um, unconsciously. They, there's a tendency for, and this is what Judd Marmer really looked closely at, um, a tendency for clients to, to, to start to kind of to, to, to almost like take after the therapist. It's just this unconscious thing that happens. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, so personal development is an important practice for any therapist. Okay, the framework, the therapist has some sort of framework and the therapist is sanctioned in some way socially. Again, it's through a license or some other sort of community um, recognition. Um, so the therapist practice associated with this would be professional development. Um, clarifying what your framework is um, and, de and developing good professional relationships. Okay, professional development um, uh, sometimes we think in terms of branding and marketing, but therapists typically don't like those terms. I don't, I've never liked those terms, but brand, but branding is really identity development, getting clarity about who you are as a therapist, which takes experience. You gotta, you gotta do stuff to get clarity about, okay, this is what, this is how I work. This is what I believe. Um, and, uh, and obviously it takes time to develop those good professional relationships. Now, the final one, emotion and catharsis, I would associate with the therapist's cultural diversification or cultural development, right? Going into the territories, and this is as in, this is recently, there's a, typically a class in graduate school about this. And when I was in the, this class, this, one of the assignments was you got to find some, some kind of subculture that's just unfamiliar to you or alien in some way, and then go into it and get experience and learn and learn. Um, uh, and and I think this is a good general practice for therapists. Any any culture subculture that just seems like that's I don't like that. That's not me. Uh, go into that. Go into that and get involved. Um, uh, um, example. I and this is probably common among therapists. I found myself like I wasn't really into like competition and sports and fighting and blah 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 blah. So I got interested in that start taking boxing lessons, you know, start watching some of that 
um, th- uh, and expose myself to the things that I've been judgmental toward and learn the value there. Uh, virtually anything that's something that humans have done over time, um, uh, you know, across the millennia, um, has some, there's some reason that the humans are doing it. There's some value to it. So if you're judgmental about, um, uh, uh, you know, hippies, uh, go to Burning Man. If you're judgmental about business, um, you know, watch Shark Tank, right? Like find ways to, to open up yourself to, to value systems or ways of being that are, that are alien to you or that you're judgmental of, okay? And, 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 and that's, how you, that's how you expand your emotional capacity and your ability to really be emotionally uh, vibrant appropriately with the clients in ways that are appropriate to them, right? Because clients have different styles um, uh, and it's good if you can adapt to that style and, and bring emotionality into the session in a, in a way that, is, that, is, that, is, that um, enlivens the, the work but without alienating the client. You don't want to be emotional in a way that alienates the client or bring emotionality into it. But emotion, the, the importance of emotionality was something that Jerome Frank looked at. Um, uh, catharsis was one of Rosenzweig's ideas of a common factor. So, okay. So that's a little summary, all right? As of the common factors, hopefully it gives you an idea, a little bit of an idea of why they're important And um, I hope this has been useful to you and more soon. Oops.